Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Heights. And on today's episode, I am pleased to announce Steve Turner. Steve Turner is the head basketball coach at Gonzaga College High School in Washington, D.C. Coach Turner has been a part of the program since 1999 and been the head coach since 2004. And during that time, Gonzaga has won WCAC titles, D.C. state titles, and also the coveted Alhambra Classic title. Coach Turner was honored in 2017 as, get this, the Gatorade National Coach of the Year winner. Uh, Coach Turner is also the co-host of the Take a T.O. with Turner and O'Neill podcast. Steve, welcome to the show. Corey, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And just to give background to people that uh, want to know our connection, um, back in 2011, I was going to move to Washington, D.C. from Lexington, Kentucky to be with my now wife. And before I moved there, I knew I wanted to continue coaching high school ball. So I reached out to all my college contacts and said, who do you know in D.C. that might have an opening for an assistant? And you were one of seven schools that uh, I met with on a trip. And after about half an hour of talking, you said, I want you. I want you. And uh, talked it over with a few people and signed on and had the privilege of coaching with you at Gonzaga on your staff for two years. So thanks for giving me a chance to coach in uh, arguably the best high school conference in America, one of the premier programs in the country. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to have you be a part of our family and certainly the work that you do with our, with our, with our young men here on high school. Yeah, and it is a family. What, why, why is Gonzaga such a family environment? How can you explain that? Um, I think it's the brotherhood. I, I, you know, I think, you know, I, what attracted me to Gonzaga initially was that. As uh, I spoke, I, I coached at two other schools prior to coming here. I did a year at Pilate High School in uh, Laurel, Maryland, which at that time was a part of the WCAC. And uh, we lost in the finals that year. Uh, uh, tough last second shot made by uh, – young man over at the math and knocked us, knocked us out from winning, winning the championship. But, and, and I spent the year at Newport Prep, which was a uh, pretty, pretty highly ranked program nationally um, and, and here in the DMV. And all the while, I just kept having my eye on, on, on the place like Gonzaga going, because I had players who played there. I was also at the time coming out of college, I was an assistant and then, uh, then a head coach for the DC Blue Devils. Um, who are national Nike uh, AAU program based out of the DMV. And some of the kids that I coached went to Gonzaga. And those guys kept talking to me about how I fit, just my personality, who I am and my character. And I'm sitting there saying, like, what do these 16, 17-year-olds know about how I fit at a school? But I spent a lot of time going to games, and their games were the ones that it kept attracting me most. And watching the, the spirit of the fans, uh, it's an all boys school, all Catholic boys school, founded in 1821. And their enthusiasm, and I'm talking about the fans now, not the players, the enthusiasm of the fans for their institution and their team, um, it just kept bringing me back. And then having some conversations with the coaches down there at the time, Bill Whitaker was uh, Coach Myers' top assistant. Bill and I developed a very good relationship. And um, he said, hey, there's some job openings. You should apply. And at the time, now my lovely wife, who's about to be my wife of 21 years coming up in the next couple of weeks, um, we were dating then, and she used to wonder why I was always taking her out to these games. And I just told her at one point, I said, that's the place where I want to work. I want to, I really do want to get into coaching now. And I, I believe that's the place where I, I can see myself being. And, you know, as, as luck may have it, fate may have it, whatever, you, whatever way you want to look at it, I was afforded an opportunity to come and coach here as an assistant coach under Dick Myers for five years. And then I was blessed with an opportunity to go after the job and um, and get it. But what makes this place special to me and, and it makes it a family environment is that brotherhood. These guys battle down here for each other. We're the one school that I could say in our conference, I kind of call us the Ivy League of the conference um, because it's not a place that you can just come and play basketball. You gotta be a student athlete, true student athlete. You've got to be student first and making sure that you're 
taking care of business in the classroom. So there's a lot of kids who want to come here, but don't don't get afforded that opportunity because maybe they're not taking care of business in middle school to be able to get an opportunity to come here. So I think we're a team that in a program that does more with less, but I think that comes because of the hard work, that family atmosphere, and that brotherhood that our kids put into that workman work mentality every single day. Yeah, and that's one thing I want to let people know that that might not know much about Gonzaga is when I got there, that was my first time being a part of a all boys school. And I just always thought, you know, why would you want to do that? Why would you want, why wouldn't you not want to be around girls as a high schooler? And after being there and seeing just the looseness that the kids had, not having a peacock and impress girls or just be staring at them or right. letting their hormones tell them what to do is actually a huge advantage because boys can be boys, right? So I thought that was very interesting. And then with those boys, the student sections at the Gonzaga games were unlike anything I've ever seen. And, you know, obviously you and I were paying attention to the game. And after the game, my wife would say, did you hear what the boys were saying? Some of it was clever and funny. Some of it got shot down right away and was very inappropriate, which you're going to get. But you get that crowd against the St. John's crowd or a DeMatha crowd. And there's there's really no better environments I'm aware of uh, uh, in the country. I, definitely not. Definitely not. And i tell you, the, probably one of the biggest compliments those guys were paid was by the GOAT, and that's Coach K. And at the time, he was recruiting Tyler Thornton who played for me. We had a big game. It was Tyler versus his childhood uh, teammate, Kendall Marshall, who ended up going to North Carolina. And we're playing O'Connell here in a sold out capacity crowd. And Coach K said to me, he said, hey, Steve, I'm not gonna lie to you. Like, I certainly paid attention to the game the way I needed to, but I definitely paid attention to your crowd because it reminded me so much of feeling like I was in Cameron. Your student body is unbelievable. Their support of your students is, is unreal. And it certainly made me feel like, made him feel like he was at home, is what he said. So that was that was pretty cool to hear. Arguably the greatest college coach of all time to talk about our student body. Yeah, with one of the best home courts of all time in Cameron oh, Indoor. No doubt, no doubt. I mean, I say this at home, when our crowd is rocking like that, it's, it's a 10-point event. Oh, yeah. Now, tell me about this. So before I got there, people were telling me about the WCAC. And, you know, you know me. I came in from Kentucky. I had my little attitude about Kentucky basketball being great until my first summer game with you guys. Where I didn't know anybody, no coaches, no players. I didn't know who Chris Jenkins was, Nate Britt, any of these cats. And there was a news channel there. Uh, the gym was packed. Chris, I think, took the first eight shots, made like seven. I said, does this guy – I turned to some guy. And I was like, does this guy shoot every shot? And soon I learned – about the Chris Jenkins style. But, um, and then I started learning slowly, talking to my wife every night, like, I think this is big time. I think you want to come to these games. And it got so good that the first time we played the math, that we were both top 10 in the nation. And we had to move the game to American University. And I actually called my dad up and said, Dad, you need to fly in for this game. He goes, you want me to fly in for a high school game? I said, I think, I think it's going to be special. And that was one of those games. I think we won by one point, stormed yep. the court. And my dad looked at me, who'd seen basketball all over the world. He's like, I've never seen anything like that before. I remember you, I remember you telling me that your dad was coming into town and, and you kind of talked about how, how you were explaining to him what he's, what he's going to have an opportunity to see. And that game was a great game. It was, it was, a, it was like a one point, one point win down, down to the wire, back and forth. I don't, think the, I don't think the spread ever got – I don't think anyone was ever up more than five points in that game. Um, and, 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 and that was definitely an opportunity for you to – for your first time to really truly taste what the WCC is all about. And then, of, of course, the DeMatha and Zag arrival. Exactly. And that's what I want to get into. So, like, that was my – I mean, I've heard of DeMatha. I've heard of Gonzaga mainly through the college. Didn't know this stuff. So, I was like, it was good for me to see this through, through my Kentucky eyes. But I want you to explain to the folks listening, like, I'm always talking about prep school and how it's the best – situation in America and they're a little bit different animal because they have postgrads and sporting but explain to folks about the WCAC and what makes it the number one conference in America I, I think there's so many areas that you can talk about in terms of you know someone will say California for years people have said New York they say Chicago um, you know Kentucky has its, its thing Indiana has its thing I think what makes this conference so great and why I believe it's the number one conference in the country is because in most of the other conferences that we talked about, they're top heavy. Like what you see is our bottom half of our teams will go out nationally and beat 
some of those other areas top athletes. And I think that's why I feel like we are the best conference in the country. And, and, and it's been, and it's been what I would say is sustainable. It hasn't like drifted ever. It's always been this. It's, it's, it's even got better as you've seen now, Glenn Farello being over at Paul six, bringing them from a team that was always at the bottom half of the league to now they're one of the top three nationally ranked program every single year. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it, and it's just on different given years, different teams, you know, rise up. Now I think the, 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 what I would call the top three to four traditionally pretty much stay the same. And I feel like that's us and DeMatha and now PVI and, and St. John's. And then you have Joe Wooten and what he's done over at O'Connell. Um, you know, and then what I think also makes it great is the coaching. I, I believe for a while there, and there's a coach who's not longer in, this, in our league by the name of Neil Berkman. Neil coached at Ireton, and Ireton's always been the team at the bottom. But I always felt like he's one of the best coaches in our league. I always said if he, if he ever got his hands on the talent that the top teams had, we'd all be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so for me is what you see in terms of what the coaches bring to uplifting their programs and the coaching that you have to do. I mean, it's, it's a college, we have a college job in this conference. Um, we just don't get college back. <laughs> um, and, and I say that in that because of our preparation, we have to prepare for each other every single night. There's no nights off. It's, it's, it's the ACC at its best. It's the Big East at its best. It's the SEC at its best every single night in this league. You can't walk into a gym assuming you're going to win that game. I mean, I can tell you right now, Ireton for the longest time has been one of the, small, you know, lesser teams in our conference, always finishing in the bottom, bottom few. We struggle every time we go to play in the packed house. They pack it for us. It's a little tough, tough, tough atmosphere. And then, and then to have a guy like Neil Berkman coaching and coming up with different things to do to, to, to trick you up and, and throw you off your game. If you don't prepare for that stuff, you, you, you could be in trouble. And that's what our league is every single night. Like you can't sleep on the team that you think you're just going to go out and beat. And guess what? Ireton goes to some states and they win a state title. Yeah. Do you realize that? Yeah, you realize yeah. that. Like, that's like, how good they are. Like, like think about it. They're, they're a team that in a, now we're now 11 team team, but they're a team that's most years 9 through 11. Most years 9 through 11. But then they go and compete in the states for their state tournament with Virginia, and they're in the mix getting the semifinals, getting the finals, having a chance to win state championships. So that I think that tells you a lot about the talent level in this league, as well as the talent of the coaches in this league. Yeah. Now, when I was there, I know some of, some weekends you'd send me out to scout and recruit seventh and eighth grade AU events, and that was my first time ever doing that. I'm not a very good judge of that, but that's something you guys have to do in the conference to get your team built up every year. How do you how do you, Steve, recruit and judge junior high talent, knowing they're four ways four years away from being men? What's, what's your secret? Um, it, well, I think the secret is who our school is. I have to recruit to who Gonzaga is, not just to recruit to say, okay, let me go get the best eighth grade basketball player. I've got to, one, do homework on what kind of student is he? Two, what kind of family am I? I got to vet the family. What, you know, are, are, do we have a family that has, has a, a, a a mentality that their kid's a prima donna and he's the next best thing since sliced bread. Those aren't the type of people that we want to bring into our, our program. Um, it's a different, you know, I think where you start with us is it's always going to start with the classroom because I've got to make sure that that kid can potentially be able to get into my school. So for us, yes, my chasing after the best basketball, but of course I want to win and I want to, I want to coach some of the best talent. There's no, no way there's a bunch about that. But I, I try to do my best in vetting early the situation and where that kid is as a student. If I have an eye on someone, I think, okay, he fits who we are. I love his tenacity. I love, he has a great basketball IQ. Um, he's very coachable. I don't watch him in a game staring up in the stands looking at his dad who's screaming and hollering. He's always focused on his kid, on his, his coach, who, who's the guy who's going to coach him in the game. Those are some of the things that I, that I, that I use in terms of deciding who I want to truly go after to see if they can become a, a young man of, of, of Gonzaga. And, and I want to find a guy who sometimes I like the diamonds in the rough. Uh, you know, I, there's kids that I see, Hey, I think he projects out 
eventually to be better than the kid who right now is the number three eighth grader in, in D.C. Because sometimes those kids just tap out. They are who they are at the time you see them. I'm always trying to project to see, hey, how much, where's this kid ceiling? Is he already there or can he, he become even more? And so I'm using all that in my formula um, of trying to find out who, who fits us. And then the other pieces, it's like, it's like courting and dating in some ways. It, it's got to be a two-way street. I want someone who wants to be a Gonzaga. Like that, that means something to me as well and means something to our school because those kids who want Gonzaga, when the tough times hit, aren't going to run. Mm-hmm. Right now we're watching a sport of runners. Mm-hmm. The transfer portal is unbelievable at the next level. I'm praying and hoping it doesn't trickle down to us, but it's, it, it is slowly. It, it, it's, it's starting to trickle down to us. People aren't happy. The first thing they're teaching their kids to do is run. And, and I, don't want, I don't want a group of runners. I want someone who's willing to, when adversity hits, I'm going to dig my feet in the sand a little, little, little deeper and find a way to be able to fight and get out of it versus, oh, coach, you know, use the blame game. Coach doesn't like me or coach doesn't do the, or, or, you know, such and such doesn't pass me the ball. I need to run. No, if this is really where you want to be, you're going to fight to stay there. And it's the one thing that I can say as a coach at Gonzaga for kids that I've recruited. I'm not going to talk about the kids who just come here and say they want to play. But for kids that I've recruited to Gonzaga, I probably have the least amount of transfers in this conference. Interesting. That's good. That's good math. It's still, though, you, help me on this. Like looking at an eighth grader, even a good one, you, there's probably hit and misses, right? There's probably a great kid in eighth grade that does not pan out. And then vice versa, there could be the diamond in the rough that just, yeah, we'll take him. And then, bam, he explodes. No, no doubt about it. And so so it's, it, it, it's, I mean, sometimes it's a crapshoot. Yeah. You, you're taking the chance. The key, I think the key is with any of these kids that you recruit, how much do they want to work? Mm-hmm. I think when you work, you may not, this may not be the kid that we thought in eighth grade is going to Carolina, but he probably still ends up going to Robert Morris. And if that's, if that's his worst case. That's the worst case. That, that's pretty down good. That's getting your college education for free. And that's what this should all be about. Yeah. Yeah. This is a part of the show. I just started last, uh, last week, uh, Steve. It's called Famous Alumni from the School. And I'm just going to throw out a few to you. And mind you, we have tons of athletes from Gonzaga. So I'm not going to do that right now but here just for the people at home that want to know some fun alum from gonzaga here we go first john hurd for those of you who don't know john hurd he was the dad in home alone mm-hmm. okay you've probably seen him in other movies um presidential candidate pat buchanan is a gonzaga grad jt3 john thompson the third former princeton coach former georgetown coach son of john thompson the second went there and then former secretary of education and the first drug czar in the u.s pro or con there uh william bennett went to gonzaga now those are just some i picked up any other fun ones uh, off the top of your head that come to mind uh alvin drew one of the first black astronauts oh sweet um what else can i throw at you um you know af- athletic wise um mark mark tillman played at georgetown played under under uh make rest in peace uh big john thompson uh, the guy who got basketball on the map down here, Tom Sluby, Hall of Famer, was at one time the all-time leading scorer here, but one of my little guys passed him. And then uh, he went on and played at Notre Dame, had a little stint in the NBA. Um, who am I missing? Um, Chris Jenkins probably pretty high well, in the Mount Rushmore now. Well, I would uh, say Mount Rushmore, Chris Jenkins. Uh, <laughs> Arguably the best shot to ever be made in college basketball history. Uh, Villanova grad, uh, currently work, working his way back into trying to play a little bit more before he has to go into the working world. Um, um, who am I miss? I'm missing some guys. Well, we're going to, there's obviously, I mean, the Wikipedia. Yeah, hey. Kevin Hogan. Yep. Big time football player at Stanford. Um, arguably right now could be, could be. The next big name quarterback in college college football, Caleb Williams. Keep your eyes on him at Oklahoma. He just outplayed the potential leading candidate for the Heisman Trophy in their spring game. Mm-hmm. So, been been some guys on the hardwood and and on the court and uh and out on the field, and then a lot of lot a lot of famous you know, who've gone gone here to high school. Oldest academic institution in all of D.C. founded in 1821. 
Yeah, and just blocks from the U.S. Capitol. You're like, you were right downtown, which is pretty cool, too. Let's go back to Chris Jenkins since he was obviously there the two years I was there as a junior and senior. And I got to work with him every day in big man drills and, you know, great kid. Um, when you saw him as a young buck, did you know, well, first of all, tell me your thoughts on Chris Jenkins on how he progressed from being, you know, kind of a pudgy, good shooter all the way to becoming a, a, an icon for March Madness from here on out. Um, well, he possessed the one thing that's probably arguably right now, the biggest skill that every coach in America wants in the game. He can shoot the ball and kudos to his mom who, when he was a young buck, never allowed him to shoot outside of the three-point line. She kept him inside the three-point line really until he got into middle school and, and allowed him to truly perfect his shot. Um, he's got one of the prettiest looking shots in the game. Most times he lets it go, you believe it's going in. But, but for Chris, his work ethic, like he's a guy who liked to stay in the gym. You know, um, in high school, a body shape that people maybe were worried about, but then you go watch him play and he just, he did it on both ends. He got like, like Chris was our leading scorer, but Chris was also our, our leading defender and taking charges. Um, and, and, and he was a consummate leader. He built his teammates up. He never ever uh, talked down to his teammates. It's always about rallying them to be the best version of them they could be. Um, you listen to the teachers who loved him in the classroom. I mean, he's the first kid they they find want to find out when he's coming back and going over is he stopping by Steve if he stopped by let us know he's coming through and 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 and, and he, he his his just his ability to to understand I think what he what people don't talk about with Chris offensively is how he understood angles hmm. and his footwork was unbelievable um and, and and then like you know said for us in high school he was playing center in college he played the three um, and it's because of his, his, his skill set. I think the other thing he was underrated as, as was as a passer. There were times, I think you could remember, I would yell at Chris about passing up shots in the paint, but he was, he was a consummate teammate. He, he wanted his other guys to shine. It wasn't never going to be about him. It was us. It was, you know, it was we, not me. And that we, not me mentality um, is why, he won, we won so many games while he was here. But uh, his ability to make a shot like that in the, in the, in the biggest moment, um, I think people forget, he did that five times for us in the senior year. Shot he did against Junior Etal, where he's got Junior Etal touching his feet. I, have, I, I post that one on Instagram a lot um, to beat O'Connell at AU. The shot that he made like that to beat the Crime Stopper, um, almost the same exact position. He hit a shot like that to beat St. John's that year. He hit a shot like that to beat the math that year. And there was one other team I can't think of it off the top of my head right now. But he hit that same, almost that same exact spot, right. that shot, to, to win about five games for us just in the senior year. And that was the year we went 18-0, and undefeated in the regular season. And then lost Neil to Neil Berkman. Yeah, and then Neil lost to Iron, to Neil Burke. <laughs> so it just, it just goes to show you, like, you know, um, we talked about the league, but, but a guy like Chris – he was an incredible bat ambassador for this program. And, and I can only just say thank you to him for all he did while he was here and all he continued to do and does give back to this school and to our program for being yeah. here. He was a special one, uh, just special. Let's talk about your son, Christian, now. Um, you picked, uh, or Christian went to a prep school in New England. Yep. And obviously we talk, you know, I help place kids. And I want to know what your thinking was, one, and why you thought Christian going to a prep school would be a good idea. And then what was your decision-making process on picking the one you ended up sending him to? Um, well, I have to first give credit to his mom. Um, she was she was a major part of that process. So there's a disclaimer, Christian's mom and I um, separated, you know, first never, not even separated, never married, but we dated. We had it. We see the child together, um, co-parented all, all the way through. And and um, so he she lived in New Hampshire. And during his his younger years, they were her, she lived in the Boston area. Um, and we kind of as we got closer and closer to high school, started feeling like Gonzaga could be the right place for him. Um, and so he did come here and do his freshman year. But I think he had been up there and been, you know, living with mom predominantly 
that he really wanted to be a little closer with her. And it probably hurt my feelings a little bit, but I, but I, but as a dad, you're always going to do what's best and first and foremost for your child. And so allowing him to, to, to figure out what he felt like was going to be best for him was allowing him to go back, back up to, to live with his mom in New Hampshire. And what we found was that Christian was, Christian was a pretty bright kid. And we wanted something that would be a little more challenging and a little closer to a fit of what Gonzaga was. And so they visited a couple of schools and, and I think he was playing AAU with a group up there and that coach knew the coaches up at, at Proctor Academy. So Proctor ended up being the school, the prep school that he went to. And once he went up there, he fell in love with it. And Proctor, um, just the way that they have their classes set up, um, his ability to go back to being a two-sport athlete, um, a potential three-sport athlete, fit very well there. Um, I think for him, it, he found himself an opportunity to be a bigger fish in a, in a, in a, in a, in a smaller pond, um, but also having an opportunity to play in one of the best private school, you know, um, a prep school conferences in America. I mean, his every night, he was going up against somebody who either played high major, high major and power five conferences or ended up in the NBA. I mean, he, he played against uh, uh, a team that had uh, Sheldon, who went to uh, Kansas, Nurse Knoll, who uh, went to Kentucky, and there was a third guy on that team. George Niang. George, yeah, George, who went to Iowa State. So those were his guard. He's guarding those three guys at his size, 6'4", every single night. And I have to tell you, he had some pretty darn good games against those guys. Um, and, and, and then that is just on the offense end, more on the defense end, which where, where he prided himself is that I think one game he held George to eight points and they played him into a, a, a tough game and they didn't have the same talent pool that, that, that those guys had. But for him, it was a great opportunity to grow. The pace of the academics was unbelievable for him. I mean, certainly if I had a, you know, a, a child here at Gonzaga that needed a, a fifth year or needed an op opportunity to go um, get another year of high school to prepare themselves for college, that's the conference I would I would want to send them to because I know what, what they would get out of the whole, which is continuance of the great education along with great basketball. Yeah, and that school with Niang, uh, Selden and Noel, that was Tilton School. Yes. And Tilton won a national prep school title that year. And then Proctor is in NEPSAC AA. So yeah, every night is just a knife fight. Similar to WCAC, a little bit different animal, but very similar. So he, and then he was blessed to be on a football team that went undefeated and they, they, they won a, they won a championship. And then uh, I guess they do like a, a bigger prep tournament and they ended up getting to the finals of that. It's almost like a state tournament. Yeah. They got to the finals and <clears throat> lost in a, in a, in a, on a late play, but to be a part of an opportunity to uh, be a part of a football program that went undefeated for the first time and to be a, a two-way player. He's a play DN and play tight end and was a, was a main, 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 you know, one of the main staples on that team. I uh, was proud to be able to go up there and watch him play. Yeah. When I went to visit Proctor a while ago, Christian was still going there and he showed me around a little bit and he just, he really just seemed comfortable there. So it was really good to see that. Yeah. And, he, and then, you know, I, I think it's, you know, I, what I see for our kids who come back here to Gonzaga, um, I know he goes whenever he's home uh, with mom, he pops in over at school and checks in on his coaches and his former teachers. They still love him to death. So, you know, as a dad, you wanted him to graduate from your high school, but for him to be able to go up there and be a part of Proctor, I, I couldn't be more proud. Well, let's talk about kids graduating from your high school. Uh, your youngest son, Jared, is actually on your team right now. For some reason, he's 6'7". I don't know where he gets that from. Um, but tell me about the Jared, what it's like been coaching him and where he's at currently on his trajectory. Um, his, is unique, his is unique because of the high and, and the pandemic. So, Those are all recessive genes right there just coming to the surface. You know, as I, as I like to say, I guess I produced the gene, but I didn't get the gene because I got a 6'4", a uh, grown man now, and then a, a, a six, seven and a half young man. Um, and I, I wish I, if I had gotten any of that height, I don't know if they would be right because my whole life probably would have been in a whole different, gone a whole different pattern. But with being able to coach Jared, I didn't coach him his freshman year. Um, I don't do daddy basketball. So it wasn't just about him being a guy in freshman, make sure he's on varsity. No, I wanted him to have a, be able to mark his path and, and, and write his own path. 
And so I thought the best thing was for him to play JV. And I stayed out of the way. I let my coach, who's a former player of mine on my first championship team, Terry Kernan, coach him up, sit him when he needed to, bomb him out when he needed to, put, a, put up his butt when he needed to, and push him in the way that he needed, need, needed to do for him playing for him. And, um, and Jared thrived with it. He ended up being the MVP that year on, on the JV as a freshman. Um, and you could just see his love for the game just keep blossoming. And then the next year, he makes the varsity. Um, but he's growing in this unbelievable rate that we didn't really understand. And after 10 games, we had to sit him down for like 16 weeks. Uh, he developed some uh, uh, stress fractures in his tibia. But what he got out of it was we go into a pandemic at the end of the year. And over the last year, the kid grows from about six to the six, seven and a half. And so I guess with a little rest um, and, and an opportunity to not do all that extra pounding on the body, this, this dude, dude got blessed with some inches that God, I wish I would have had. Um, cause you, cause you got injured in high school, right? I kind of yeah, changed your trajectory too. What was your injury? I, I injured my knee. I had a, um, I, I basically, basically went bone to bone. And that kind of slowed me down a little bit. Um, and I ended up, I ended up going to college to play soccer. I didn't even end up going to play basketball. And actually the sport I should have kept playing stupidly was baseball. So oh, I would really? probably, I, I had a chance to get drafted out of high school, but I, I gave it up for girls. Um, <laughs> should have been a Gonzaga, right? <laughs> <laughs> should have been Gonzaga. Um, and, and, but what's been fun about coaching him is, is, is just watching it, like being that close to watching his development every single day. Um, and, and then watching him, you know, watching him around here in these halls and to be able to hear what these teachers say about him as a young man and how he work, how he works and does things the right way. Um, just makes you proud. Like certainly, I, you know, I'm joning for him to get to one of these places he wants to go to and praying that, you know, God will have a way for that to happen for him. Um, but, but, I, but if he doesn't reach the places that he's reaching for and land somewhere else, it's going to be okay because I just think he, he's – I'm just proud of the way he's handling himself as a young man and the way he's developing every day on and off the court. Yeah, and I remember coaching there. He's just a little gym rat, just always had a ball, always shooting, yeah. always with us. So he's, he's grown up in the gym. And um, it's, it's nice to see his progress now. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing yeah. how that progresses. But since we're on your family, let's, let's talk about your wife, Leah, obviously. Uh, I'm very close with your wife. And th for those that don't know, Leah took a leap of faith in her life when she left corporate law to become an acupuncturist. And we were talking one day and she's like, do you want me to try it on you? And because she was in school getting, going through training. I said, absolutely. I've got a stomach problem. If there's any way you can help me with that, I would love it because I had IBS since I was probably in junior high and it was debilitating. I mean, it would, I'd have to cancel plans, cancel trips, be in constant stress. And Leah's like, well, let's see if I can help you with this acupuncture. And, um, you know, after about a year, I, you know, she says she doesn't cure me, but whatever she did acupuncture wise and healing wise, I no longer have those issues. And it has absolutely changed my life to where my wife and I would said, I would, you know, remember us having conversations where I said, I'd pay a million dollars. I'd pay, mm -hmm. I'd pay everything I have right now to not have this, this problem. And Leah fixed it. And, you know, I tell her that all the time. She's like, no, you fixed it. Your body knew what it needed. I just, you know, help, you know, help you find it. But tell me about, you know, your wife, Leah, who one's a coach's wife, who has her own challenging position being a coach's wife. We all know that's never easy, no matter what level it is. But then taking that, that leap of, you know, big time job for the rest of her life to one that might not be as lucrative financially, but may more, be more satisfying, you know, spiritually and with helping people. Give me your, your, you know, 30,000 foot view on, on, on your wife and how, how that's all turning out. Well, one, I'm, I'm blessed to have my best friend be my wife. And we've known each other since middle school. Um, I mean, I'm a, I'm a class ahead of her. Um, we met in band class, probably for me picking at her. Um, and then we always were in the same inner circles. Like we always had the, the same friends. And even then when we get to high school, we, we both lived out of our jurisdiction of our school. But when you started a high school in Montgomery County, you can stay there. And so we ended up living like 
a walk away from each other. Mm. And so our travels were always together and we became really good friends. Um, I think when I look back now, pretty much always had our eyes on each other, but never, ever crossed that path. I dated some of her friends. She dated some of my friends. Um, and then both came back out of college, uh, had some tough relationships, found our way back to hanging out again together and, and in the same circles. And then I think our friends who were around us were like, excuse my French, but am I allowed to curse on this thing or no? Just let's, I don't want to, I've never put the, checked the box yet. So. so excuse my French, but go for what, it. what the heck are y'all waiting? Mm -hmm. um, and we end up dating and, and then the rest is history. Now we're May 27th, we'll be 21 years married. Um, but I think what makes Leah special is her willingness to always think about others and give to others. And, and it started with me. I thought coming out of college, and certainly when we started really being serious um, and potentially looking to court and become husband and wife, my mindset was that as the breadwinner, I needed to be the breadwinner. And I probably needed to go into corporate America and kind of put maybe my dreams of being a coach and working with kids aside. And at that time, she was an attorney. <clears throat> And she, she did fairly well. And she kept doing fairly well in that field, um, changing to different, you know, law firms and moving up the ladder and making pretty good money. Um, and her thing was, you should do what makes you happy. Don't make this about money. Money will come because you're happy doing what you like and what you want to do. And so she, she's the one that gave me the chance to really pursue my dreams, which is doing what I do now coaching and working with, with young men um, at the high school level. And it's not a it's not a it's not a money profession. If you were doing this for money, you're doing it for the wrong reason at this level. Now if you're going up where they're offering some pretty good dollars, yeah. All right. That that's a different thing. But I just felt like, you know, it was important. I don't know, just growing up I always thought it was the man's role to to be the lead in terms of finances and, and everything, pretty much. And she taught me and showed me that it didn't have to be that way. And that the things, that, the fruits of your labor would, would pay off if you work hard at doing what you love. And I've been blessed for 20 something years to do what I love and, 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 she, and she was right. And then it flipped for to see her struggling with a profession where sometimes it's nasty, people are nasty. Um, you know, one of our last jobs working in the Senate division, and I don't know if people know what that is. That's a division where you're representing a lot of times uh, parents who have had their kids taken away from them because of what someone may call neglect. And then there's people who, you know, it's the stuff you see on some of these, you know, uh, I'm a big Law & Order fan. I watch Law & Order. Uh, the mom who left the kid at home because she had to work late nights and left the eight-year-old watching the two-year-old, something like that. And next thing you know, the neighbor calls and Child Protective Service comes in and they snatch the kids. Now they're in the system. Even when she truly believed that her clients had done all they were supposed to do to do right to get back their kids. Our system is our our court our system is is messed up. And 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 these people fighting to try to do all the right things, they still just keep losing. So in her position, she's fighting for people who most time are going to get ruled against. And it just I saw it burning her out like in a way that wasn't healthy. Um, stress levels you could see because she was fighting her hardest to help these people get their kids back and could never win, you know, maybe get some visitation, but never get their kids back in their homes. And she just, you know, she got out of that and went into a little more of the corporate world of, of law. And it just wasn't who she is. Lee is a, she is a, is, she's a helper and a fixer by nature. And for her to be able to find this path. And she was like, I don't know what to do. I was like, you got to do what you told me to do. Like, go pursue your dream. We'll figure this out. Like, 
we don't have to go live in some old expensive house or whatever. We'll, we'll figure this out. If we got to downsize and do some different things, you know, we'll figure it out. Work a second job for me, doing camps and doing other stuff. There was opportunities to make up the difference. And so she pursued her dreams and went back to school. And now she's blessed uh, having gone back to school, having uh, worked in uh, some other some other places to now have her own business um, and doing what she what she truly loves to do, which is helping people. And so, um, you know, they say the man is usually the rock. Nah, I, I, she's the rock. Uh, you know, what it, what it Katie, Katie said, told his mom she was the real MVP. She Leah's the real rock. And I, I couldn't be more grateful. And I'm certainly blessed to have a mate, but most importantly, a best friend like her in my life. Yeah. I think she's a keeper. You should keep her for another 21 years at least. I, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Some days I worry she might kick me. <laughs> kick me. <laughs> no. Nah. But, that, but, but, but that's... You know, it, it's nothing in the world being able to be married to your best friend. I don't yeah. care what that says. It, I, I don't. I don't have to have like a lot of times people are like, well, I don't have to have a lot of best friends. I, I I sleep next to my best friend every night. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. You're in the one percent when it comes to that. I think. Let's get back to coaching a little bit. Um, where's somewhere? What's somewhere in your coaching repertoire that you think outside the box that you're that that you don't. And I don't know if I don't know if you want to give away trade secrets, but where what's your proprietary thing that you can offer that you don't see anyone else doing? I, and I don't know that I don't see anyone doing this, but I think where our success has happened down here is I spend the regular season focusing on us. I think sometimes some guys that we go up against overthink it and worrying about the other teams too much. I, I think our league number one is not one for the regular season. It's one little three-day weekend, four-day weekend in late February. And it's, I probably piss a lot of guys off in our league because I say this in a paper and I say this in, on video. We play 20 scrimmages. And what I mean by that is I'm going to take every advantage of those scrimmages to prepare for that one weekend and go for broke. So during the regular season, especially in the first half of the season, I truly focus on us, us becoming the best version of us that we can be. And that's locking into what we're going to run offensively, locking into what we want to be able to do defensively, not always focusing in in that first matchup, how much I need to know about St. John's or how much I need to know about the math. But I focus in on, they better figure out us. And, and then the second half, you got them on film. You, you got them on tape. You're probably going to watch them play one or two more times. All right, what is the key going to be to beat them? It, especially if you get the opportunity to play them a third time. So we may key in a little more on some of the things that they do and what we might be able to take away. And then it's, then it's all right, coaches, let's get, let's get in this. Let's get in some film room. Let's get in some talk. How do we want to? How do we want to go for the third meeting, which is make or break, win, 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 win or go home. And so, I think what makes what I do unique is 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 just a little different than what I see some of the other some of my counterparts do with their team. And I, and I can tell that on how they're calling out our plays early in the season. Like I've just say that. If you're spending that much time on trying to beat me in a regular season game, like I'm, a, I think I can get you the third time because I think you're gonna overthink. You you end up overthinking what to do against us, and I don't want our kids thinking that way. I want our kids focused on this is what we do. Let's make them have to figure us out. Yeah, makes sense. What about this over your career? Who's shown up and been the biggest surprise for you as a player? Wow. Great question. One of those down in the rust that maybe you're like, yeah, we'll we'll take Johnny when and, and then he just that's exceeds a, your expectations. That's a great question, coach. Yeah. Well, maybe, I stumped you. You go it got me going through the years. Um 
It doesn't have to be the exact one. How about just give me one example? Recent one. I mean, the most recent. Um, see, I knew he'd be very good for us, but I didn't know he would become the all-time leading scorer, and that's Chris Light. Mm -hmm. Five foot, whatever you want to call him. I'm sure he's never really the size that we put in the, in the book. Um, heart over height. Like, his determination and his will to will us to wins – um, to prove to the world that he belonged. Um, and people will be like, ah, he's not a diamond, right? Well, I was really the only one recruiting him in our league. So obviously he was, you know, it was probably come to us, maybe one other school or stay right at Bullis when he was at as a middle school. And I don't think anyone in our league saw him doing what he, what he would end up eventually doing for four years. So I, it probably is him. Yeah. And now Chris likes is that uh, he started at University of Miami and he transferred to? He's transferring to Arkansas. He just graduated uh, a few days ago from Miami. So he uh, has, has an opportunity to be a grad transfer now uh, because of this crazy portal um, at Arkansas. He's going to have an opportunity to uh, get a little, at least a year's tutelage from uh, a guy similar to him in Earl Boykins who's a member of the Arkansas staff, um, who, if you think back and look at his career, people probably didn't think he'd be who he was. Funny thing is he's now working for the man who gave him that opportunity in the NBA and muscle. Um, so, I, I, you know, when I look at Chris and what I know he wants for his career path, it, it, this could be a very um, special year, win, lose, or draw. Um, but the opportunity to get and gain some some unbelievable knowledge from a guy who's very similar to him in stature, who who had an opportunity to do what Chris's dreams are. Yeah, I mean, there's no better fit in America. I don't care if that's a he's at you know just the lowliest of low D ones. If Earl Boykins is there, that's where Chris should have gone. Just to just the experience of being around him every day is just going to be so yeah, valuable. I, I think it's going to be unbelievable. Just yeah. happens to be at a good school in the SEC, so and and, 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 and still be able to be in a place where uh, he'll be on TV every other night. Yeah. All right, I'm going to give you a power here. You are in charge of the NCAA. What uh -huh. changes are you going to make? Um, immediate changes is that I've got to fix the portal. How? Um, and and and, and, I'm, and it's not just for basketball. Is it? As 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 a black man in America. I think for so many ways that our system and things are set up, my brethren have been taught to run. And I, and I believe that the way that this portal is set up, not just for young black men, but for all men, and, and I'm not gonna even talk to the women because you don't really hear about the women going and jumping in this portal. But we talk about the men being the rock of households. And if we are putting a system in place that teaches them not to fight through adversity. What kind of leaders are we going to have leading our world in years to come? Um, so for me, that would that would definitely be the first fix. I'm not saying that we don't need to have a system where kids can have an opportunity to go elsewhere if it's not right for them in a place. But for me, when I'm watching guys who are leading scores, faces of programs, throw their name in the portal, what, what are we teaching kids? You know, I, I think I think you can have this portal, but I think there should be some information. I think, you know, if I had a way to sit down with the NCAA and talk to them, why don't you do something like keep the keep the waiver piece in, in place? If you wanted to transfer after your freshman year, you still have to fight for the waiver or you sit. I'll give it to you after your sophomore year. If two years have gone and this isn't the right fit for you then yes, maybe we grant the one year, no sit transfer, but give something a couple of years before you go running and meet. Um, if I had the opportunity to, to head the NCAA, that would be my start. Um, I think with the way that things went down with this pandemic year, I think they jumped the gun also on the kids coming back. I think there should have been a thing if a kid played at least 80, had a chance to play 80% of their games this past season, which a lot of them did, I don't think you had to grant them a year to come back. Um, 
because now you've created a trickle down effect that is hitting hard on these 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 student athletes at our level, which is going to create another problem here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I'm and I'm living it. I have a son who's in the middle of this mess, and and to feel like at times I'm talking to college coaches and I feel like I'm uh you know Steve the used car salesman. It sucks. Never had to do this, and I shouldn't have to do this. Um, but but the, but the NCAA keeps trying to put band aids on different things, and I think they have to do a better job of having conversations with people on the ground level. Doesn't mean we have all the answers. Doesn't mean our answers are right. But I think that somehow, some way, there needs to be more high school coaches, maybe on their panel or their board or their trustees, whatever they have, of who they're talking to when they're looking to make these decisions, just to be able to put themselves in a position to have, you know, maybe us be just a little bit of a devil's advocate. Okay, yeah, that is going to be a great thing. Well, did you, you know, but then on the other hand, well, do you think about this? How about how this is going to affect these kids? And are y'all thinking about that? Because I don't think they're thinking about it. And, and, it's, and it's a shame. I mean, to see 1,700 kids there's not that many schools that would be able to house all those kids, even if there was blank slates of scholarships at 150 plus schools. Still, there would still at the end of the portal be people, or, in the, or when we start the next school year, kids are still sitting in the portal with nowhere to go. That's going to be interesting. That's going that, to be it's going to be a wake up call for a lot of people too. I think. Now, I, I do think the people who will benefit from this, JUCOs and prep schools. They should be smiling all the way to the bank right now. But maybe, I don't know, maybe not. But I, I, I think they're the ones, because of the, the trickle-down effect, the high school kids will have an opportunity to put their hands on some kids that they probably wouldn't have gotten in years back. That, but that's the thing about prep schools, too. And I've been just discussing this till my face is blue, is now these prep school coaches have to take these kids and then place them next year into the same environment. It's not going right. to be better next year, Steve. No, it's, it's not going to be. be actually, less spots. Not- it's still gonna be. It's still gonna be a mess. This is this is this is this is gonna affect a few classes before it gets right. What I hope is that kids will see. What I I hate to say this like this, but I hope there are enough kids that don't have a place to go to that people realize quickly. We better. We got to figure out how to fix this. Yeah. If we can't keep having this happen. You don't have to hope that it's gonna happen. Just it's just numbers. Yeah. And I've had a four. I've had a bunch of uh, former prep school kids that have transferred this year, and about four of them have upgraded. Right, so they've gone from this level, and after a couple of years of experience, they've bumped up. So it's been good for them. I've got another bona fide D one kid who waited a couple of weeks, and now he's scrambling. Right, coming from a D one scholarship player, played at a big time prep school, and he's scrambling, and he's a no brainer in a normal year. Right, so if he's having problems, what about all the guards? Right. Mm-hmm. That's what I just don't understand how with all these guards in the world, how you can fit them all at the college level. And Steve, this is my crude, my crude analysis of it all. But you've had 18 years if you're a class of 21 kid to get your game right, get your grades right. And it's a it's a one. It's not a need like you're you're not guaranteed to bump up a level. Right. right? It's pure capitalism. Right. If you're good enough, you'll find a spot. If you're not, it, it's not you, you're. It's not like bitty basketball where everyone gets to play. You're, there's just I, not I, enough spots. I, I had a chance to ask a question of Paul Biancarni, um, and he aired it during one of those games early in the year when they, when they were able to still have some of those like uh, uh, top uh, uh, non-traditional high schools who were playing those games on ESPN. And I asked him that, like, how does this whole thing going to affect? He said, and his thing was, it's not going to affect the top 20 kids but if you're not in the top 20, it's going to affect every. It's going to affect you, and you know the elite are going to get their opportunities because they're going to still be recruited, and people are going to try to get them, or they're going to get their chances to go to the G League. It's the it's the it's the other kids who who are four stars and below that are going to get caught into the misses. And one of the things he said though that I thought was was good was that I asked him, you know, what would you have? What would you tell to a student? who is going to be one of the ones caught in the mess. And he said, be proactive. Be proactive. Um, manage your recruiting, your, some of it yourself. Call these coaches. Reach out. Have them readily available. Um, 
put yourself in the best light for them to get to know you. Take advantage of your likeliness now by using your social media platforms the right way um, for people to be able to hear about you, see about you, you know, posting your posting your scores, posting your grades, um, making sure that you give teasers of clips, but also be ready to have full game film because coaches are going to want to see that film. Um, they want to see you in your best and your worst. Coaches don't want to just see the highlight film where you where you look great on every single possession. They want to see, you know, how how's he coached? Like some of the stuff I talked to you about for what I look for. How are you coached during the game? Are you the guy that hangs his head when you miss a shot? You know, they're they're looking for a little more of that. Because I think the one thing that I worry, Corey, is it's gonna get thrown out the door. I don't want to hear any college coaches talk to me about culture anymore. What Interesting. Culture? Like right. think about it. What like if you're selling my if you're coming in my, my you're gonna be there's gonna be some coaches that are gonna come in my couch to sit down with me and my wife to talk about Jerry. I don't care what the levels are. Don't paint me the picture of culture. That should be the that might be the worst thing you can say today to family because if you're living in the portal right now, how do you have culture? Right. How, how do you have culture with a guy who may come and stop at your come and stop at your place for, for a year and then move on? That means he's never going to be an alumnus of the school. So there is no culture. Like, that's what I worry about. I worry about the relationship. These guys on the road now, all that sitting next to each other, jumping up, loving, loving it up, and talking about the guys that you might be recruiting and he's recruiting, that ain't going to happen anymore. I'm telling you right now, I'm waiting for the first fist to cup to happen this summer if we get to have live periods. Because it's going to happen. Because there's going to be some guy who, who's in the DM of a player who's on somebody else's staff, and you and that guy are supposed to be boys. And all of a sudden, he's realizing, hmm, well, transfer for this kid can leave and come to us easily if I can get, get a, have a little contact with him. It's the NCAA created the monster. And certainly, I'll go back to San Diego. If there's the one thing that I could have power to fix, that would be the one. Yeah. And for the, yeah, that's a good answer. And that's for what I tell people about Juco or prep school is it's buying you time. Because we're going to see how this shakes out. It's going to be the first year where a lot of these programs have transfers for the first time or more than one transfer on their team. Coaches are going to like it or they're not. I mean, Calipari does this every year. Last year's team had one returning player. And as a guy that grew up in Lexington and had family play for Kentucky, it's, you didn't know who any of the guys were. It was like mercenaries almost. And Calipari is equipped to do that. Are these other programs equipped to do it? Oh, look what he just did. He just took – Illinois just had an unbelievable year. Cal just walked in and took their best two assistants. Forget their players. He just took their best two assistants. It's going to be a mess. It's going to be a mess for a while. And you're a parent in this with a good player, too. So, and, and, um, and, and, and who's nervous? Like, take my coach's hat off as a dad. I'm nervous for my son's recruitment right now. I, I'm not going to lie. I, I'm, at times, having to talk myself off the ledge like I have to talk to my own, my other players' parents and saying, be patient. This is going to fall through. He's just got to do his work and be ready when the opportunities come. Yeah. One thing I think kids and families need to be mindful of, you may not be able to chase hard after what you want. If you got something that's there that wants you, you better look at it hard and, 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 and know what, look at what you all can get out of it in the end, which is one, hopefully a free education. Two, hopefully a degree at a place that, that matters for, for life after that school. Do you know a good lesson I learned from you early was Will Rasman was really wanting to go play Ivy League. And Will was a 6'9 kid, great grades at uh, Gonzaga. And he had a bunch of Ivy sniffing around, but none could pull the trigger. And you said, well, if you go there, you're not going to go for free. You're going to be paying tuition to play there. Why don't you go to a good academic school for free, then go to an Ivy League for your master's where you're actually going to be around guys that are going to be in your career field. And I thought that was excellent information for kids that had their, their eye on the prize. So you can and do that look, same thing for and, other situations. And look at him now. He is chasing, I think, two Ivy League masters at the same time. Like something crazy. He's, yeah, going, he's in the surprised. middle right now. I think a law degree and a business degree from, from two Ivy League schools. Yeah, so get your college paid for free. Maybe it's not the ideal academic situation or playing situation. No one cares about that in the real world once you get older, right? But no he, one cares. But he, but he also got his undergrad from a place that the degree matters. Loyola University. That's exactly. just like staying there in Ivy League education. But you take care of business during your four years, you'll be able to get a master's degree. And that's way more important because then you're going to be more siphoned into your eventual career field, your interests. 
and then bam, that's where you get a job from. So I thought that was excellent advice that I still give people all the time because, you know, people are set on ivies, right? They really are, but you don't go there for free either. Yeah. So, uh, I know we're about uh, time's up. A couple quick hitters here. And this is all good information, Steve. We could talk for hours on. on... Oh, we, uh, I'm free. If you want to keep going, let's go. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to um, this recruiting thing here. So you have your son. Is, is, is Jared 22 or 23? 22. So he's. Okay. Tomorrow, tomorrow is our last regular day of the school year. Okay. And in a short week, he will be AC. All right. So, and 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 I love how you said you've got to take that hat off and and be and be a a, a reasonable dad versus crazy uh, out of out of control dad that's wanting this for his son. And you're you you if this is affecting you, it's going to affect everyone, right? Because you keep it cool. You know how this process works and everything. Um. If you don't have what you want for Jared, would you consider a postgrad year for him? Be totally something. I like. I go back to thinking what you said earlier. Like, okay, postgrad year. He's still in that. He's going to still be in that same messed up spot. I think right now he does have some opportunities that are in 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 that are being presented to him currently that we will be comfortable with if that's all he gets. Okay. Um, and I think he's comfortable. I, I want him to be comfortable. If he's okay. not, yes, I definitely would consider. If he's yeah. not, then I would consider. Be hard for me, but I would consider. In 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 advising him as best as possible is is, is what's the most important thing when you're looking? I know every kid's got their own thing they're looking for for a school, whether it's size of conference, whether it's home court advantage, whether it's academics, locations, coaching, and all that goes into fit, right? What's you use one of the most important things for Jared as far as a fit goes? Um, I got I mean, the reason the way I'm putting this, like say you're choosing for Jared, right? Steve Turner's choosing for his son, knowing all you know about this process and placing all the players you've placed in the past, not naming a school, but what's one of the things you're looking for? Um, the place where life after basketball is going to matter. Uh, we're not chasing NBA dreams. I mean, if that were to ever come, that's 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 the you know cherry on the top that I would say God gave, not not us. Um, I think Jared has Jared Jared knows what he wants for himself, and those things that he wants for himself, I think truly fit into what both he, me and his mom would want for him. We haven't had to have that discussion like. Uh, you should do this. You should do that. Um, I think allowing him to go through this process in his way to a certain degree um, has opened his eyes. Certainly being able to do Zoom calls with Ivy League schools um, and those guys being able to talk about, they probably are bigger on talking about life after basketball. Um, it's got his mind thinking, making sure he goes to a place where that fraternity can benefit him when he stops playing. Um, that's something that's important to him. And, and, and so it's certainly become even more important to me because I now know that he's not going to make just a basketball decision because I don't think it should just be a basketball decision. Um, you know, if I had my per – are, are you looking for me to say where I think is the perfect world? No, I don't so, want you to do that. But I'm thinking – what I'm uh, trying to figure out here is, like, is coaching – is a coach that's been to a place that you respect that's not going anywhere, you don't think? Like, is that more important for you than maybe the academic piece or the the, the – I mean, I think, it's a, I think it's a piece to the pie, but I don't think it's the most important. The most, I think the most important piece is his ability to be a part of a fraternity that's going to be able to – that he'll be able to go back and reach reach to um, when he stops playing. Okay. That, I think that's that's – that's probably a number one, a number one for me. Um, I think basketball wise, Jared has always had to fight and find his way. So he's not afraid to do that anywhere, whether that be at Stanford or that be at American University. Um, he, he, he knows what he wants and what he's going after. So that's what he's fighting for. I think his thing right now is I'm gonna shoot for the moon. And I think I'll, at worst case, I'll fall among the stars and he'll be comfortable in, in that situation. I do want a person, I do want him to be able to play for a coach that loves him for him. I think he's had it rough these three to 
coming up on four years with stuff that he doesn't even talk to me about, but I know it's there because I, I, I see it in different ways that he doesn't probably even realize I see it. Those who believe he gets what he gets because of me, it has to suck. Like that has to suck as a child. Um, and you're out there fighting and, and working just as hard as anybody else to always have to hear, oh, you're getting this because you're bad. Like, it, it's sad for me to watch people that we call it family. Like, people whose kids I've coached that played with him with simple stuff like an Instagram gets po a post might get posted about him or Twitter gets posted about him. And to see some of these families always like everybody else's stuff. But when it comes up about him, they don't like it. And I know that my kids never, my kids friends with these, with their, with these same parents, kids, like they're cool. They talk on the phone, they play video games together and they still play on, have played on teams together. But to see that, like, I don't even know what to call it, hatred or whatever. I don't even know what to call it. But to see that when I see your posting and you're liking everything else, but when my kid comes up, you're away. Yeah. See if you're looking forward to him at least getting a fresh start somewhere too. Definitely. But I'm even more excited about next year. Yeah. I'm going to get back to a norm and I really get to coach him. Because I really haven't gotten to coach him. Like even coaching him in grade school, that wasn't real. To me, that wasn't really coaching. That was having fun. That was really helping another crew of kids. I, I probably did more for other kids on that team than I ever did for him. He didn't start. He didn't, wasn't like I played daddy basketball. He had to earn every piece of what he got. And he's had to have to do that now. And I think he's he's now earned an opportunity to probably be a starter for me next year, to be a big piece to our puzzle next year. And I'm excited for him. And I'm excited to be able to coach him through it. Yeah, it's a delicate balance, coaches and their sons. Yeah, it's, I mean. it's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Because I'm harder on him than anybody else. And sometimes it's funny because the other people don't even see it because they're so fixated on my baby is what I always say. But every parent, it's my baby. Mm -hmm. I switch right. I, I mean, I switch him. I think the thing I got to learn through the pandemic, I, I developed a, a really good friendship in a cohort with a cohort of guys here from the DMV that we were two nights a week. I'm talking nine o'clock to one in the morning. And it wasn't always just basketball, it was life, family. I mean, there were conversations on Zooms that brought us to tears. That, and the one thing that one of the coaches kept telling me was like, Steve, you got to do for him the same way I've watched you do for hundreds of kids in your career. Don't shortchange your own. Like, you can't do that. I know it's hard. It's probably hard because you feel like you're overselling your kid. But you, you got to do for him right now no different than you would have done for Chris Like and his wishes and dreams, to Chris Jenkins and his wishes and dreams, to Brian Crawford, Nate Britt, Prentice Hub, all the guys you've been coaching. Like you got to go make those same phone calls for your son the same way that you would have done for them for what they wanted. And, and I can tell you as a, as a coach and a dad, it's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. Because I feel like when I talk to these guys who rang my phone millions of times about other kids, that I'm trying to sell my kid to them. And I should have to sell him. He's good. Kick and play. He does something that every – he does the one thing that every coach in America needs. You got to have shooters. Yeah. And now he's got the measurements. He's six seven, and he's not done. Like, I, I, I don't, I don't know why I, ha I feel like I have to sell that. But these guys out here do, and I think the problem is you got a lot of coaches that don't coach with their eyes anymore in terms of recruiting. They rely on these scouting services, and to me, they rely on eyes who never played the game. I don't, I don't get that. Like, I don't, I don't get that at all. Like, I think there's a lot of assistant coaches in America right now, they're going to hate me for saying this, who just don't do a good job because they follow them. They follow, they it's monkey see, monkey do, in my opinion. So, oh, they're recruiting that kid. I need to get on him too. Quick hitter, who's the three, who are your three favorite assistant coaches? Or who do you think the three most honest assistant coaches are that you deal with? <clears throat> in college basketball mm -hmm. or have dealt with like get it that, that just that don't don't do what you just said and they'll, they'll be proactive on things my number one in all of all time but he's not an assistant anymore he's a head coach now dave dickinson 
Dave Dixon, who was assistant coach for Gary. Dave Dickerson came to this gym no matter what. And and I never had it. In my time with him at Maryland, I don't know that we ever had a guy that was the fit for them. But I always knew Dave was going to come in once or twice during the, the off seasons when the coaches were able to come in your gym. Dave Dickerson was going to call to ask about my kids, who might be the guy we should look at. Um, he was consistent. He came and looked with his eyes. And, and, I, and I had the utmost respect for him always to death, to, to death do us part. Um, I will always have the utmost respect for him and how he did things as an assistant coach. Um, and real quick, Dave is the head coach currently at USC Upstate. So. Correct. Mm-hmm. correct. Um, wow. Good question, folks. I mean, that's the thing about when I first got to Gonzaga's gym and and just seeing like the firepower that would be in there, like Roy Williams at a 7 a.m. workout, Sean yeah. Miller by himself at a 6 a.m. workout, Tom Crane flying in just to see uh, a Saturday morning workout, and then everyone else that just was on the sidelines. And that's just what a lot of high schools, 99% of the high schools across America just don't get that. So uh, I would say next, Jason Williford. Mm-hmm. UVA. Jason's a state. He's he's in our gym. He's checking in to find out who we got. Um, even when we don't have somebody for him. And he's had a few that he liked. Didn't either didn't either get, or they even had to go in a different direction for what Tony wanted. Um, but I can count on that every time we have open gyms and workouts, he's gonna be he's gonna be there. And he's checking in to find out. Steve, who's the guy coming up? Or who's the guy that maybe we're missing that I should probably take a better look at? Um, and third, just trying to think over the years, Coach. It's been so many. The, the, the guys that aren't mentioning your top three will let you know about it if, if they ever listen to this. Which you no, know, and, 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 and certainly there's some other guys that, would, that could get up there to the top three. Um, Let's do this. Let's not wait. Those are two good ones right there. I know both those guys. That was great. Good programs. Those guys are hustlers. Um, and they're gonna they're gonna make their way up to, to the big leagues one day. So uh real quick hitters here. Biggest win of your career. First championship, 08. Oh, good one. Good one. First championship, 08. Best Tyler player. Thor- Tyler yep. Thor- that was Tyler Thornton, Ian Hummer, Max Kenyon, Cam Johnson, Terry Kernan, Wes Dunning, Rodney Gould. And, and, and a cast of other characters. That was a good, great group. Awesome. 30 best player. 34 and one best. 34 and one best record in school's history. That group. Nice. Yeah, it's up on the wall, all over the place. Cedric so. Lindsay. That was That's great. Right. Um, best player you ever coached against. Best player I ever coached against would have to be as an assistant coach. Or do you want me to have, give you the one as a head? Let's coach? do both. As an assistant coach. Keep bow games. Mm. I, I, I love him. I, to today, I still love what he did as a player in high school basketball. He, he was special. And I've coached against some unbelievable, amazing pros, guys who are, who are, who are NBA vets, all-stars. All but as an assistant coach in high school, Keith Bogans did it on both sides of the ball. And I, I still don't believe he got enough credit for who he was as a player. As a head coach, hmm, that's a tough one too, Coach. Crime Stopper was a, one of the most memorable games I've ever been a part of. That, that we watched highlights the other night, actually, and just we could not believe. As a dynamic player, it'd be him. Yeah. By the Crime Stopper, we're talking about Akil Carr Akeel from Carr. Patterson High School yeah. in Baltimore. Uh, that, uh, that could be the one coach. Next to him, I would say like Marvin Bagley. He was pretty darn good. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, what are your hobbies when you're not coaching? Uh, just downtime with the family. But uh, I love to play golf and I love to fish. 
Nice. All right, last one here. It's a doozy. It's your favorite movie of all time. Wow. Scarface. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Scarface are coming to America. And that's two different opposite spectrums, but those probably would be the top two. Oh, two classics. Well, Steve, um, tell us a little bit before we go. You have a podcast with Casey O'Neill, who's the head lacrosse coach at Gonzaga. Great guy as well. Tell me a little bit um, about what you guys cover and give your give your pitch for it. Well, it, it's, you know, sports always kind of the premise, but we're open to talk about anything, everything. Um, things that are going on in the world today. Um, and, and, you know, especially with all that has happened over the last – year and a half with social injustice. Um, and we're going to talk a little across. We're going to talk a little hoops, soccer, uh, family. It, it, we, we'll touch touch base on a little bit of everything. So it's just taking a T.O. with Turner and O'Neill. And um, we're, op we're open to discuss any and every, any, it's any and everything podcast. But it always, there are always going to be some stories and conversations that do revolve around sports. Oh, that's great. That's been going fun so far. Fun so far into our second season. Um, uh, getting ready, getting ready a few weeks away from wrapping up our second season and heading into our third season. This has been unbelievable fun, as I like to call it. It's my mental health Monday. We'll be re we'll be recording tonight. We record on Mondays and then uh, uh, we we air our air our episodes on Thursdays. Um, and you know, being able to do it with a with a with a colleague who's we become one of my best friends. Um, it's a fun time. And then being able to have it engineered and produced by a, a, a high school classmate who's been a really good friend of mine as well. Um, we're having a blast with it and, and, and I love bringing on the guests. And we want to keep it going and we got to get you on there soon. Let's do it. Well, Steve, hey, it's this is like talking to family here. It's, it's good having you on. And I appreciate taking the time this morning. And I think you filled us in with some great nuggets today. And um, I just, I just appreciate being in my life and uh, giving me the opportunity to coach with you 10 man, years ago. So, and likewise, folks, I, I'm so blessed that you came into my life. And I'm glad to be able to call you a friend and I love you to death. And thank you for all that you've given to me while you were here on the staff. And as you continue to allow our friendship and uh, to just continue to grow and love you and the wife and excited for you guys. And I'm so happy for you guys to be able to make that move when you did and have a little one and all the good things that keep happening happy to see all the blessings that keep coming for the two of you. Oh, I appreciate that. And I love you too. And, and, you know, Leah, like I said, changed my life. It's, I'm a completely uh, upgraded version of myself now because of her. And, and we, we talk about Leah all the time. Like, oh, I, I, I know you do. Cause she keeps telling me she wants to move to Colorado. <laughs> see the pine tree. See, I've, I've, I've done this I'm before. Looking this. In the I'm looking, I'm looking. Well, sometimes there's snow falling actually in like May. I think our last one had snow falling last week and it's just, and we have elk uh, out that window right there. So this is completely opposite than the mean streets of DC. But uh, get you, hey, come out here do a official recruiting trip and uh, look. You, you call your alma mater and tell them to uh, make a call to Jared Turner. We can get get an official visit out there, and make it happen. Dude, I, does Jared want to do the Air Force Academy? Because I can make they will sign him sight on the scene. But Jared, I don't, I don't know if he wants to do. that. I don't know that he wants to do academy. But, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't want to do an academy, right? And I went there. And, you never like like I said, I didn't think he'd want conversation with the Ivies. But after having conversations with the Ivies, he fell in love with it. So it's it, it's really how people make make and can show you what they are and who they are, then maybe it's something that fits you. If you don't have those conversations with folks, you'll never know. And you know what? I, I was not, I'm not a military guy. I wasn't even when I was in the military. I'm my own guy, but I did that because it's my only D1 option. So Jared's going to have options, which are going to be nice and a little bit different. But if you want to hear my five minute pitch, um, I'll absolutely give it to him, but it's unlike any other um, college path. Well, army and Navy, but um, it's, it's its own animal. But once you do it, I mean, just kind of like being that Gonzaga brotherhood, you're, you're set for life. 
So, but anyway, that's an off-topic discussion. But Steve, have a great day. You Thanks too. so much for coming on the Prep Athletics Podcast. You can catch me anytime you want to on the, all the major platforms of podcasting. We put this up on YouTube as well, and I'm on social media. You can follow the updates there. If you like what you uh, hear, leave a review and subscribe. I hate asking for that, but people tell me which is what you got to do. So I'm asking it. it. Got to do it. We do it too. But uh, thanks for joining in, and we'll see you all next week.